John Martinka is known as the escape artist. The following is a talk he gave to a group of business owners and executives. John discusses dramatically increasing the value of a business and creating dynamic exit strategies so the owner can get the price they want for the business while other sellers cannot. Let's go back in time to the beginning of the 20th century and imagine we are looking down on the part of the world now known as Slovakia, which was then part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And we are watching my grandfather and his best friend push wheelbarrows with tools down the road. Now the wheelbarrows are just a prop. They are there in case stopped by soldiers, they can say, we're unemployed, we're looking for work. They made their way to the Polish border, crossed Poland, got on a ship, headed to America, and worked for two years in factories and foundries till they saved up enough money to send for their wives. Talk about having to escape a situation. And for many people, many business owners, there's, there are situations to escape, maybe not quite so dramatic, but it's perhaps escaping the plateau your business is on and getting to another level, or that ultimate escape where you want to exit with style, grace, and more money. So to set the tone of what's going on in the world, or my world, of buy, sell, and exiting, look at the front page of your handout. First question on there, how many small, medium-sized businesses are predicted to sell in the next decade? 70%. 70. 50. 50. 40. 40. 45. Reverse auction here. 80. 80. 80. Okay, so I'm going to give you three answers, and Stan, you are actually one of the right answers. According to the Wall Street Journal a couple years ago, set, they predicted 70% of small, medium-sized businesses would change hands within 10 years. I did a survey of business owners, 50% said within the next decade they plan on exiting. And most recently, PricewaterhouseCoopers released a study saying that two-thirds of companies between 5 and 50 million in sales would change hands in the next decade. Whichever number you use, it's a big number. Second question, how many owners believe their business is ready to sell for maximum value? <laughs> Just about. Any other guesses? 90. 90. Five. So, five. Let's bring those together because in a survey I did, 28% of owners said they thought maximum value they could get right now at that time. Now the third question is according to Wall Street Journal, in a study they did, what, what percentage did they think were actually ready? 30. Five. Ten. Ten, right. 10%. So you can see the numbers. You can see what's going on. Nobody will buy your business is a statement that deflated George, about the same as when a pin hits a balloon and sends it swirling around the room. George had a nice small business especially when George paid attention to his business. But George also had an outside interest, and every time the business was doing okay, he'd go play. And then when the business was struggling, he'd come back to the business. So his sales looked like a roller coaster. It was like a sine wave. And by the time I met him, because the ups never matched the downs, his balance sheet was completely underwater. We started working together about the 4th of July. Summer in his industry was notoriously dead. We took the summer to concentrate on marketing and sales. We put in a plan, we implemented the plan. By the end of the year, sales were 33% ahead of projections. Continued on into the next year. And by the middle of the next year, two companies in his industry approached him and were interested in buying him. One made an offer. George turned down the offer, because now business was fun. Fast forward five years, that same company came back, made George an offer, which he accepted, and, and received more cash at closing than the total price of the original offer. That's what we're talking about when we talk about preparing a business for sale. Now I could talk for a couple hours on all the things I'm gonna to do to talk about today, but I've condensed it into some of the high points, and that story emphasizes the high points, the three things I'm gonna talk about. Growth, what we did with George's business, preparing a company for sale, 
and what his acquirer did, growth by acquisition. And we're going to start with growth by acquisition. I'm going to tell you just a quick story about Rob. Rob bought a business a number of years ago. In his first year in business, he was approached by, we'll call it a friendly competitor, more of a complimentary product. And the gentleman said, I want to retire. Would you buy my business? With in parentheses, hint, hint, I know you're a buyer. You just bought the company you own. So we talk about growth by acquisition. Let's go to the next couple questions on the handout. How many owners feel their focus is to grow their business? Percentage. Yeah, percentage. 60. 90. 98. 98. Close, 77%. How many owners are open to the idea of growing by acquisition? This one surprised the heck out of me. Survey I did recently, 86%. That doesn't mean they're going to do it. That means they're open to the idea of doing it. So why would you want to do it? If you look at this graphic, if you see a company and their sales are increasing, we know profit never matches that. You get to a point where you have to hire a new employee, things flatten out. You grow again. Maybe you have to hire a new employee and a new piece of equipment. When you grow by acquisition, you can jump, and jump both of them up at the same time. As my co-founder and partner on call, Ted Leverett, would say, why try, just try to beat the competition, eat the competition? So let's talk about 10 reasons why a company might want to consider growth by acquisition. It's on, uh, I think, your third page of your handout if you want to follow along with me. Number one, to expand a customer base. You know, Rob did that. One of my other clients, Keith, did that. He's a manufacturer distributor. He bought a small manufacturer that he was distributing their product. To get great employees. <clears throat> when it's tough to hire great employees. This is an interesting story because of all the similarities. This goes to two clients, both in Los Angeles, both distributors, one fasteners, one packaging products. Both guys' names began with D, Danny and Devin, and both we were working together to acquire similar companies to theirs because they just couldn't hire good salespeople. And they figured, well, buy a company, get the salespeople and the customers that come with them. Access to vendors that you might not have. Number four, enlarge your geographic footprint. Eric did that recently, bought a company in California. Enlarge his geographic footprint. It can make a lot of sense. There's a, you avoid all the costs of starting that office and just having to steal customers from the competition. Eliminate a competitor. Number six, how about spreading your overhead over <clears throat> a bigger base? Keith did that in the story I just told about acquiring a small manufacturer. He brought them in-house. He eliminated rent, phones, everything else. Increased the margins tremendously. Qualify for volume discounts. Number eight, get needed equipment. One of the guys in my Rotary Club a number of years ago, Frank, we worked on two deals together. He bought two people in his industry. One of them specifically because he was looking for a certain piece of equipment. This company had it and amazingly also had the customers that go with that equipment. It was, and it was a true win-win. The last two things on my list don't get mentioned too often. Showing you can do it. Being able to prove you can assimilate another company into your operation. And that plays when it comes time for your exit strategy that you can say, look, we know how to do a transition. We've already done it. And then finally, bigger companies sell for more money than smaller companies. All other things being equal. So there you've got 10 reasons, 10 strategies on growing by acquisition. So let's talk about some benefits. Well, there's a benefit to the seller. They've got a good buyer. 
They've got someone who knows how to run a business. And in, with the demographics going on, as we saw from some of my early questions, that can be very important. Because according to a study done by Intuit, people who make QuickBooks, the baby boomer generation is one of the most entrepreneurial generations ever. And the generations following aren't as big and aren't as entrepreneurial. So you could be that knight in shining armor to the business owner who can't find someone else to buy their business. And you can all, they can also sell a marginal business where maybe they couldn't sell it to an individual. And as an, as an owner, you can pay more than an individual can, still get a higher return on your investment. Second benefit, it helps you focus as an owner on what you need to do and where you need to be improving as you look at the criteria of what these companies have. And third, it puts you through the due diligence process. So when it comes time for you being on the other end and your eventual exit, you're familiar with what's going on in due diligence. And as my, my friend uh, and banker Lisa Forrest says, banks are going to be nosy. Get used to it if you're, if you're selling a company. Banks are going to be nosy and guess what? So are buyers. So growing by acquisition is biting off a big chunk. And it's not always feasible. Sometimes there just aren't candidates out there. Sometimes you're just not set up to do that. Your capital is going somewhere else. But you still want to be growing. And in this, in this economy, we're, it seems at least for now, we are poised to be seeing a lot of companies grow. You should be growing by at least 10%, if not 20. In fact, if, I would tell you if you're not growing by 10%, you should be worried. So let's talk about other strategies to grow. Let's look at, uh, back to your handout on the first page. First question in the third section, what percentage of owners feel their priority is to increase the value of their business? What was that? 25. 25. 50. 80. 90. 90. Who said 90? Good. It was in, this, in this study, it was 92%. So how do you increase value? You know, you can do one-time things like cut expenses, but that only lasts so long. So really, it's about growing the top line and therefore growing the bottom line. So one of my clients very eloquently said to me once, he said, growth hides a lot of operational warts. And that's why we're talking about growth. So rhetorical question. You know, think about this. What gets in the way of growth? We could talk all day about that, right? So question I want you to answer. What's worse than having a company with the capacity to make a million units a year and selling 250,000 other than having a higher capacity? What's worse? Having the capacity to sell a million and only being able to make 250. That's right. Selling a million and only make 250, those customers are going to feel pretty bad when you don't deliver and they're never going to come back, are they? So when we talk about growth, I want, I want to start out by going back to the old three-legged stool of business that you've probably seen, that there's sales, there's operations, and there's finance, and these have got to be in sync. So keep that in mind as we're talking about any kind of growth strategies, that three-legged stool. So let's assume you got the right product, and you've got the right, ser or right service, you've got market demand. Think of this old adage in business. You can say to your customers, you can have price, quality, or service, any two of the three. It's just impossible to give you all three. So when you are selling based on quality and service like many of you are, that gives you competitive advantage, doesn't it? And you grow by leveraging your competitive advantage. When we talk about strategies and tactics for growth, you know, look, I can make a list of 25. We don't have time to talk about 25, so I've got five I'm going to talk about today. And the first one is the most important, and it has to be on the top of the list, and it's, I call it attitude. Some people call it culture. A culture of growth. If you don't have that, 
If you don't have your team on board, you're not going to grow. So who sets that tone? The CEO. The CEO, the owner, right? You guys and gals. You set that tone. And you get people on board. And what does that involve? What could you do to get your people on board? Does it mean you diving in there? Incentive programs. Incentive programs? Communication. Communication. And sometimes it could mean stepping back and doing nothing and letting qualified people drive that growth train down the tracks. So it just depends on your situation, right? There's, there's no right or wrong until you know exactly what's going on in a particular company and particular situation. It, it can also mean not playing by their rules. You know, creating your own playing field. And if you want to think about it on a big picture scale, and I know you're small business owners, but on a big picture scale, think of Apple. They created their own playing field. The iPod, the iPhone, the iPad. They didn't just go with what everyone else was doing. As business owners, I would like you to rate yourself. On my handout, second page, under the category growth. On a one to 10 scale, and then I would like any, if on any of these you want to share, I would appreciate it. Anything you've done to, to improve and help in these areas. We work on innovation as opposed to problem solving, fixing things. Rate yourself on a one to 10. You don't have to announce it. <laughs> Second one, on a one to 10 scale, new ideas get implemented successfully and on time. Who's got good luck with that? Good success. Few of you, okay. I know exactly how to motivate and get the most out of my key people. Yeah. What do you do? Uh, you know, share revenues. Share, you know, basically tie their compensation to the success of the firm. What do you do? Uh, also, management by appreciation. Management by appreciation. Okay. So. Yeah, you know, here's a few things when it comes to working with the employees in that situation. Don't be a controlling owner. Employees don't like being micromanaged. They want, they want to have some freedom. Uh, you've got to let them stumble. You've got to let them fall occasionally. What you want to do is make sure that when they stumble or fall, they're falling off a chair, not the roof. And even if they're falling off the chair, you're there with the cushion to make sure it's a gentle landing. And that really comes down to delegating and giving people the freedom to make some mistakes, but also not doing anything that an employee could be doing. When you do that, you free yourself up to drive new innovation, new initiatives. Last two questions on that rating. My company, its culture, and employees are poised for growth. Who thinks they're up 8, 9, 10? I think one of the things I've learned, particularly in the last five years, um, is to share uh, the good and the bad with the employees. Uh, let them know what the company's doing, uh, and, uh, which verifies their role. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we're in a very seasonal business. We're also in one that uh, tends to move up and down with the uh, uh, the economy, uh, probably more dramatically than the economy, and uh, I found that uh, just uh, laying it out there uh, is uh, really builds the uh, uh, staying power of the employees, so you don't get the turnover, which is probably the most most costly thing you could possibly have, and it increases the loyalty dramatically. Thank you. So the last rating question there: Our management teams team works together for growth without wasting time protecting their fiefdoms. On a 1 to 10 scale, rate yourself. And I'm going to show you, show you I want to show you this because you, know, you as a business owner, you've got a future vision and whether it's documented in writing or not, somewhere you see it clearly. Your goal has to be, when I ask these type of questions, is to make sure employees have that same 2020 vision of where the company should be going. Does that make sense? Okay. So employees are, are always the 
issue, a lot of things regarding the growth are always people related. Uh, employees want their ideas accepted. Bob bought a company, he held a reception afterwards and the sales manager came up to me and thanked me for helping put the deal together and her comment was, he's been a breath of fresh air. He actually listens to our ideas. That's the position that you want to be in. Uh, employees want to feel a sense of accomplishment. It, this is very timely. Just the other day, my daughter, who works for a company that's going through a little turmoil and maybe even a quasi-turnaround, said, I love being part of the team that's going to make this thing good again. Employees want that. And they also want to see a, a career advancement path. You know, I have a couple of companies and also a nonprofit I'm on the board of dealing with that issue right now of if you're not growing, where are your employees going to grow to? And they're going to go somewhere else for their career advancement. So when you're doing this, think of the employees, but also think as you're going to get that 2020 vision of creating a sense of urgency. Think like a salesperson. Think like a sales manager. And I remember one sales manager I had, I had this great line, he always said, at the end of the day, make one more call. Because he knew at the end of the year, that was 250 more customer contacts. And that, that lends itself to results. So attitude is first in growth. Second is planning. And if you look at your cover sheet again, this is a study done by a big, one of the big four accounting firms. Companies with a business plan have blank more sales and profit growth than companies without a plan? 100. You got it right. <laughs> Double. So I used to teach a class on writing a business plan. Take that in context when I say do not go on the internet and do not go to the office supply store and buy the latest whiz bang business, business planning software. Sit down at your computer, type out all the answers to the questions because then what you're going to do is print it off and put it up on a shelf. And you don't want a shelf plan, you want a working plan. This is, you as business owners, this is not the kind of plan you write as if you're a new company looking for funding. This is things to help you improve and, and grow. These are things where you're gonna cover what works, what doesn't work. What have you done? What are the results, the, you know, the, the numbers in there, whether it's marketing or sales or your, your budgeting and uh, working growth capital projections, uh, whether it's your management structure. And when I say management structure, we all think of an org chart. And think of that org chart today, but also think of that org chart here. What's it going to look like in five years or three years, wherever you want that vision to be? What people are you going to need? So what skills are you going to have? So as you move along that path, you can fill those positions. And it means something that sometimes scares small business owners, and that's have systems. And it doesn't mean Boeing or General Motors process management. It means a way of doing things over and over and over again. I'll give you a very simple example. One of my clients was a remodeling contractor. And they were struggling because the owner thought that his job was to make the customers happy by starting the remodeling project. No, his job was really to make the customers happy by finishing the remodeling project. <laughs> so he'd start all these projects to make people happy over out on the job, and then his employees would spend half their day running to supply houses and back and forth to jobs so every, all the customers said, oh, they were here today. So what put in a simple system? The job doesn't go into the queue to start until three things happen. The customer fills out a form. Everything they want done. Everything. All the materials are delivered to the job site and a deposit is made. Then they get in the queue to start the job and then the job gets started and finished. Amazing what a little system like that could do and what it did for that small business. So think about these things as you plan and make sure there's some goals here. I mean, it's just not a vision. It's, it, there actually has to be some concrete goals and objectives and make sure everyone's on board with those goals and objectives and that they are reachable but definitely a stretch. So we talk about planning. Let's go back and let me ask you another question on here. The top reason CEOs say growth targets are not met is? Economy. Nope. Competition. Nope. Wrong people. 
Not the wrong people. Not implementing. Getting caught up in the day to day and never getting around to this. So it's, it's taking action. You know, it's to getting out there and doing it. And when you get out there and do it, I like to say, pay attention to the right details. Not all the details, the right details. You know, think about what fishermen do, or fisherwomen. They know the right place, the right time, the right bait. I have a cousin who goes salmon fishing on Lake Michigan. What he told me is, we're on the lake half an hour before sunrise. We're off the lake two hours after sunrise, because then we're just boating. <laughs> if you don't, you got to know the right details to pay attention to. Uh, think about going to a sporting event. Think about going to a concert, a play, a movie. Those performers practice their details, the, the little intricacies of their performance over and over and over again until when they hit the stage, it all comes together. And that's what you should be doing in your business and your people should be doing. So the details I want you to think about following through on have to do with, we'll call it the non-financial factors of the business. Your customers, your employees, your suppliers, the competition, your marketing, Pay attention to those things in detail. And then one of the most important things that you can do, one of the most important details is follow up. Don't just do it once. Have a plan to keep going on it. And take care of your people. I think a couple of you mentioned how you take care of your people with different kinds of sharing of revenue and uh, acknowledging good work. Uh, that's very important. So I want to give you a story. Uh, Dick and Kathy owned a distribution firm. He was the president, she was the CFO, and the firm was poised for growth and they took advantage of it. Uh, they said having good management depth allowed them to concentrate on the big picture. And they put in a plan and most importantly, they implemented it. And I want to tell you about the, what they did. I'm going to read to you what they said there are five benefits from planning work. Faster growth, increased profit, higher salaries, increased local market share, a growing national client base. Now, every one of you would like to have at least some of those, right? Yeah. So I was an outside of observer you know, working with them, but there's no doubt in my mind that paying attention to planning and the implemented a plan is what let them have this rocket ship growth. And very important because having management skills is one thing. Using them is another. In other words, not doing anything someone else could do, but concentrating on leading and developing and your future vision. So back to a couple things on the details I talked about. One in marketing, one with employees. Had a client, sold wholesale, sold to end users, every year did an end of the season wholesale only sale. Called me a month before, said, we're planning the marketing for this event, here's what we're doing, what do you think? He talked about all the things they were gonna do to get their wholesale customers in the room. I said, that's good, but it's not gonna work unless you, a week before the event, pick up the phone and call everybody. Simple little detail, right? Monday morning, eight o'clock, I get a phone call. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Our wholesale only sale this weekend, five times bigger than any other. I said, well, okay, that's great. Why are you thanking me? She said, because we asked everyone why they showed up and they all said, because you phoned us to tell us and remind us. Little detail. Ken owned a distribution company. Naturally, he's in the business of selling things. He put in a program called the Quota Buster, similar to sharing revenues, except instead of just sharing things on a paycheck every month that they made their quota, the employees got a cash bonus. I mean cash, he went to the bank, got cash, and gave it to each of his employees. Boy, did that motivate the heck out of them. So planning, implementing, and then you've got to make some sales, right? So sales is next in my five things. Uh, 
that one more call is a good strategy. I mean, if you, if you have any sales managers or salespeople, you know, if you can get them to do nothing more than make one more call, you're ahead of the game. If you learned one thing today, and that's it, you're in good shape. So if you're not growing, what does that mean? Does that mean you, your people are not making enough calls to new and existing customers? Does it mean you don't have a good value proposition for them? Does it mean you don't have the right people? I mean, we can't analyze that today, but you've got to be thinking about those things. And you've got to be thinking of who are you taking care of? And the last question on my quiz, is it cost blank times more to get a new customer than it does to sell more to an existing customer? What do you think? Four times. Ten, four, five. Yeah, I've heard in things I've read six to ten times. That's why we pay attention to our existing customers. You know, it's a, it really, sales is really a numbers game. And it's, it's also, when we talk about systems before, it's a systems thing. Your people have to prospect. You've got to build a relationship. You've got to ask questions and qualify. Uh, you've got to find the need. You've got to show interest. <clears throat> For your types of businesses, this is not selling used cars or being in a carpet store where a friend of mine who owned a carpet store chain told me, if someone comes in the store and walks out, 90% chance they will never be back. That's not relationship selling. You want relationship selling, right? So back in the 80s, I went through a program called Counselor Selling. And one thing that stuck with me on that, and I've heard repeatedly since, is there are four reasons people don't buy. So think about this in your companies. No need, no hurry, no money, no trust. And the last one is far and away the most important. Because if you get to someone and they need it, and they need it fairly soon and they can afford it, if you've done, if you've done your job, you'll make the sale, your, your salespeople will make the sale. And it's a win-win, right? Because you're solving their problem. So my last of my five growth strategies is financial. Too often business owners pay attention to their product, their service, they really get involved with their customers, <clears throat> and they forget about the numbers. They tend to just look backwards and say, oh yeah, we did good last year. And then they run into some problems because they're not looking forward. Now I've come to have a deep appreciation for what CFOs do because they're looking forward. Uh, you know, the, we go back to my description, my visual here. The three-legged stool business, the financial part tells you, are your sales and marketing in sync? Uh, if, you're, if you're creating good management reports out of your numbers, you know what lines are profitable, what markets are profitable. Uh, you know, are, are your margins okay that you can keep producing at that level and make a profit? Are your, you know, not the, your pipeline? I worked with a company, you know, if they, would always, they were always bragging about their pipeline. By the time we got done with them, they were able to see where their pipeline was. Because believe me, there's a big difference if you've got a pipeline of $4 million in sales and it's all in the next six months, it's a lot different than if it starts in six months, it goes for two years. You've got a whole different focus on your sales department, right? So pay attention to the numbers. Uh, accurate information, uh, good people, good systems. And reminds me of another client because their accounting department, their accountant was really a bookkeeper. There were three bosses all telling the accounting There were three bosses all telling the accounting department what to do, all giving different direction, and not one of them knew anything about accounting. <laughs> <laughs> so how typical is that? And then finally, you know, I know it's tough. Resist the temptation to just completely Blur the difference between your personal and business checkbook. Your banks don't like it. The IRS sure doesn't like it. And if someone's going to buy your business, they're going to be very skeptical of things. So growth by acquisition. Some growth strategies to increase the value of your business. And it all, it all accumulates into, at some point, all businesses sell, right? Either, either as a whole or in parts. They may sell to an outside buyer, inside buyer, but they will change hands. And to, as we talk about exiting, 
I want to tell you about a beautiful summer weekend I had. I know it sounds like it doesn't go together, but it does, believe me. At our lake, and my cousin had his one-person sailboat up there. You're a sailman. See, you're a sailor, but no, not a one-person <laughs> sailboat. Uh, one, my cousin had his one-person sailboat there. And he taught me how to use it, and he explained how to set it up, tear it down, all what the different ropes did. And I went out, and I spent a glorious weekend. It was about 80 degrees, little wind, just zipping along the lake a couple times a day. Uh, just had a great time. And he says, when you, when you come back here in a month, feel free to use it. And went over again, what a how to set it up. So I get back there in a month, throw on an old pair of shorts, life jacket, get out there on the boat. And it wasn't a beautiful summer day. It was a rather blustery day. And before I know it, I'm in the middle of the lake. And I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I don't know if I turned into the wind, writ the wind or crosswind. But the next thing I know, smack, the mast is hitting the water about six inches from my head. I'm underwater. I yell for something, and all that comes out is gar, 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 gar. <laughs> I make my way to the surface after kicking and thrashing because these ropes are all tangled around my legs. When I get to the surface, I realize, no, it wasn't the ropes. My old pair of shorts had caught a pocket of water, and I've just kicked them off. Now they're floating away. <laughs> and I'm a rather modest guy. <laughs> ah, don't laugh. <laughs> and I'm imagining everyone has now run onto their docks with their binoculars looking at me as my bare bottom swims over to get my shorts, which I do. I get them back on. I come back to the boat, assess the situation, and I'm close to half a mile crosswind against the wind back to the cabin. I'm about half a mile to shore with the wind, and I don't know how to get the boat up. So I gave in. And I got on the other side of the boat, and I kicked it and pushed, swam the boat into shore, stood up, and walked it back to the cabin. So we as humans tend to go headfirst in the things we know little or nothing about. And you wouldn't believe how many business owners I've talked to have said, I'm thinking of selling my business. I've never done it before. But then they think they're experts on it. When it comes time to exit, be thinking, what have I done to make this business as attractive as possible to the most logical buyers that are out there for my company. We won't get into that part of determining it today, but just be thinking about that. Because what I don't want you to do is have your business be your prison. Because savvy owners always have an escape plan. That's why they have a smile on their face. As I said at the beginning, I want you to, I want you to be able to exit with style, grace, and more money. Uh, don't be a prisoner. And definitely don't be a prisoner if you're in a situation where there's a death sentence. You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I started out talking about George and realized that when, what, what was done with George's business created a better business, and a better business is easier to sell. Uh, so let's talk about some rules of exiting. There's some on your handouts. You can go along with me. Uh, Number one, searching for a buyer is like sales in a company. You've got to go out and prospect, or your intermediary has to go out and prospect. They don't just fall in through the rough some weekend, and they're there for you on Monday morning and say, hey, here's a big check. Number two, cash is king. Cash flow is king. The more cash flow you have, the higher your price. No other way around it. If cash is king, the queen is relationships. And like in chess, where the queen is the most powerful piece on the board, relationships are the key to getting a buy-sell deal done. Nobody buys from or sells to somebody they don't like. I got that line from a client who had started a business, sold it, and bought two. And it's very, very true. Number four, as a business seller, it's not what you get, it's what you keep. Pay attention to terms and structure and taxes and all of that. Number five, there are no perfect businesses, there are no perfect deals, there are no perfect buyers. Don't get hung up waiting for that perfect deal. There, there, there is no such thing as perfection. Don't fall for valuation traps. We're going to talk about those in a few minutes. There are no simple, easy ways to just say what a business is worth. And above all, 
don't let your buyer get over leveraged. It could come back to haunt you no matter how you've structured it. So those are my rules of exiting. Uh, right below that, you see my action plan to sell a business. I came up with this a number of years ago to get owners to think a, uh, have a system and structure. And it's very simple. Uh, you arrange the affairs of the company. You coach the company, its people, everything on what's going on. You transmit all that great information about your firm. And that great information includes the intricacies of what makes your company special, the operations, and why they're in good shape and ready for a transition, and the numbers, which we talked about just a few minutes ago. Why the numbers are accurate, good, can be relied upon. So in exiting a business, when exiting or selling a business, We've got our vision, tactics, and implementation. If you're here in box one, you got the vision and you're taking action, uh, but you're just being completely ineffective. If you've got the vision and tactics, but you're not doing anything, of course, you're stagnant. And if you're doing things, but you don't have any vision, you don't know where you're going, you're just wandering around, you want to be here in the middle, number four. So think about that. And then let's go back to my rating sheet on exiting. I've reduced or eliminated any dependencies the company has on me, the owner. Rate yourself on a 1 to 10 scale. You know, we have great financial systems. We've developed a solid management team. Anyone want to comment on any of these? The, uh, well, the second one about great financial systems is not only to have them, but to use them and to use them in a timely manner so you can actually... <laughs> right. You have them, use them, but not a year from now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good. Great point. I know the value of my company. And that's, a, that's an interesting one. Let's talk about that just a little bit as we finish up here on a section on exiting. I said don't fall for valuation traps before. Uh, there are some myths of business valuation out there. One of them is that you see a company in your industry that's doing 400 million in sales that's sold for 10 times EBITDA and it's been in the Wall Street Journal and you think, wow, my little company, whether it's four or 40 million, is going to sell for 10 times EBITDA. It's not. It, just face it, it's not. <laughs> there are set ranges of acceptable ranges where small businesses sell as a multiple of profit and it's nowhere near 10 times. And it, that range is also affected by things like industry specifics, uh, the non-financial factors. I mean, a company with uh, three customers accounting for 70% of business is a lot riskier than a company with 70 customers accounting for 70% of their business. And then terms play part of the deal, because cash talks. The more cash, you get a little more leverage on the price. Second one, rules of thumb can usually be thrown right out the window. And especially if it's a rule of thumb that says, my business is worth X times revenue. And every time somebody says that to me, I ask them this question. And I say, your business you're telling me is making about 10, 12% profit. There's someone across town in your industry breaking even. Does that mean your companies are worth the same because it's a function of revenue? They get the point real quick. Third myth of business valuation, my business is different than all the other ones that these rules were created for. I have so much potential. In other words, you're telling a story, or should we say a fairy tale. So keep those things in mind. And then what, are, what do business buyers like? And I don't care if you're talking a private equity firm, an individual buyer, another company. Start out with things we've talked about a few times here. They want good numbers. It's always the starting point. Every buyer says, I'd like to see three years of financial statements and tax returns. Which when you talk about preparing a company for sale, I like to say allow three to five years. Because any changes you make will show up in those financial statements that the buyer's asking for. Reduce your dependencies, especially on the owner, 
customers, key employees, even a key supplier. Have a good sales and marketing program as we've talked about, a culture of growth. Have a solid management team. Again, uh, most buyers don't want to see you working in the business. They want to work on the business. I have never worked with a business buyer who says, well, you know what, I'm buying a company so I can get in there and run the machine or make the daily sales calls. They all say, I want to work on the strategy and the vision and the growth. And then finally, they want to see value. They want to see a strategy to increase that value. They want to have their skills be appropriate and they want to see opportunity. So if the buyers see that there's a vision and potential, but they don't have the skills, they're going to fail. And nobody wants that. If they, there's a vision and they have the skills, but there's no p potential, they just bought themselves a mediocre job. And if there's skills and potential, but there's really no vision for the customer, they're just lost. And it, by the time they find out where they're going, it may be too late. So you want to have, number four, a successful sale, successful transition, successful future. Any quick questions before I close? To what extent does a pipeline or sales funnel apply in a company sales situation? Well, your pipeline in, your pipeline in, in sales is your, is your future orders, sure. your future business. Right. And it's got to be managed to match up with your production capabilities. You know, going out and selling, having your salespeople, let's say you've got the capacity to do 10 jobs a month and your salespeople are having a great month and they say, well, in May we've sold 20 jobs. It's managing that so that there's not zero in April, 20 in May when you're not going to deliver and zero in June. And it's looking ahead and saying, boy, our sales pipeline is pretty low. We better get our salespeople work. We may, maybe we need to make some different offers. We're not being, our offers aren't being accepted the way we're offering them now. Um, John, I come out of the technology and internet markets, and the track record of acquisitions and mergers is pretty dismal in that <coughs> sector, mostly because of the people-related issues, culture um, plays a huge role. Um, so I'm curious about the work that you do in looking at cultural fit on an acquisition. Well, yeah, we look at the cultural fit, and, and the big part of it is the owner. And if the, because in, in my world and most of your worlds, not technology, uh, if the owners can get along, that means, and they've built rapport and relationship, that means that that owner is going to have a really good chance of relating to the customers, the employees, everybody else. And uh, so that's the starting point. If it looks like it's a big enough that there's going to be a culture problem, I will usually bring someone in who specializes in that to do an assessment or work with them afterwards. And usually buyers uh, of small, mid-sized companies are very gracious in wanting to get information and help from the employees. Probably one of the biggest things I see is that the buyer will come in and ask questions of the employees and actually listen, and the employees love that, because usually there's somebody who hasn't been listening. So let me close, and I want to ask you this question. Raise your hand if you ever, back in high school and college days, had a great, fun summer job. Anybody? OK. So mine was working. <clears throat> in an amusement park in northern Wisconsin. And part of this amusement park was a Wild West town. And one day, and I don't know why, they asked me to play the bad guy. And I must have done pretty good because I played the bad guy the rest of the summer. Now, playing the bad guy meant three things. Number one, on alternate hours, I would hold up the saloon, then hold up the train, and then in the meantime, walk around and be mean and nasty to everybody except the girls. So th this amusement park had a really cool little train ride. It went for over a mile through the woods. It was a scaled down actual replica. Just size was just smaller. And it was a great family thing. So every other hour, I would go out. And near the end of the, end of the train ride, I would push this paper mache boulder onto the tracks. Train would come around. Driver would toot the horn. 
stop it, I would jump out from behind a tree, fire the gun in the air, and say something clever like, this is a stick up. <laughs> so it, in, it always ended with me rolling down an embankment, the marshal coming down, grabbing me by the shoulders, pu pulling me up the embankment, making me push this boulder back off the tracks and take me into jail. The pitfalls, the problems I've talked about today in growing and acquisition and exit strategies are like that boulder. They're easily pushed aside. What you need is a proven plan, an experienced guide, and pay attention to the plan and its details. If I can be of any help moving your boulders, please let me know. Thank you. The preceding was John Martinka speaking to a group of business owners. To book John for your next event, phone him at 425-576-1814 or email him at john at johnmartinka.com.